I'm going to give a little bit of background information on who we are as a network in Glasgow. Um, but before I do that, I thought it would be lovely if we, if the panel all introduced ourselves. So I'll go first. Um, my name is Jade. I use she, her pronouns. I am a visual artist, but I work primarily in participatory settings, so with communities. Um, I've worked with all different types of people from all walks of life, so everyone from kind of refugee and asylum seeking communities to kids, care experienced young people, um, and yeah, everything in between. I've done it all now. Um, and yeah, I'm also the coordinator for Glasgow Connected Arts Network. Um, so I look after the membership and I plan networking events, training events, and one-to-one -one mentoring support most of all. Um, so that's me, and I will I'll just go this way. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, my name is Hannah Eusta. Um, I am a participatory artist um, for about the past couple of decades, and uh, theatre was my practice, my background originally, but in the way that the arts work, I can turn my hand to many different projects. Where it's led me now, I do a lot of producing projects, lecturing, um, I facilitate the participatory arts short course through the Glasgow Connected Arts Network for young people aged 16 to 25, so I've worked a lot with young people, but I've worked in the prison sector, um, I have worked in schools, I've lectured performance at college, but my focus is always on access, inclusion, and yeah, at the moment I'm also working at the National Library of Scotland in events and access in uh, Kelvin Hall, where we're looking at more community groups and more diverse communities accessing the Moving Image Archive. So, past few months I've suddenly become a film expert, which I am <laughs> not, um, but I'm pretending I am. <laughs> Um, hi everybody, my name is Ty, I use they and she pronouns and I primarily work in the third sector on food, so I'm not primarily a participatory arts practitioner but recently, um, and I kind of work on food access and sustainability and food policy a little bit, um, but lately over the past few years I've been using the arts to explore different issues and specifically in my food work. Um, and I've over the past kind of six, seven months been running a food focused craft group which kind of takes a different arts medium and explores different food issues um, once a month. So um, I've recently received some funding from the Bold Collective that are connected to Glasgow Connected Arts Network to run that. So I'm sort of getting more into participatory arts but generally through a food lens. Um, hi everyone, my name is Phil, Philippa Tomlin, and I am um, an artist, I'm a visual artist and a performance maker. Um, I'm a collaborator, I almost never work alone, um, whether that's with um, other artists, um, with a capital A, or whether that's with um, community participants, um, it, it varies and it's exciting and I'm ever curious and learning from everyone that I work with. Um, similar to the panel, I've worked across a whole range of um, different communities and with lots of different people in my 23 years um, of uh, community practice. Um, originally a theatre maker um, and I've migrated into visual arts um, where I'm, I'm quite happy at the moment. <laughs> um, so that's me. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Um, can we get the next one? Yeah, so before we kind of jump into our panel conversation, I just wanted to give a little bit of background information about who Glasgow Connected Arts Network are, what we do. Um, so we're a network of about 600 practitioners um, and grassroots organisations who work across lots of different art forms. So it can be anything from visual art, to music, to theatre, to carnival arts, everything. Um, it's really, really diverse. And um, we're all kind of united with the idea that we want to apply our practice to working with people. So in some kind of community setting, um, we have kind of practice-based researchers in the network. We've also got um, 
people who kind of use their practice in all different settings as, as we've seen here. Um, so yeah, we, our job is to encourage collaboration between <coughs> communities um, and we facilitate kind of skill sharing events, we run a professional development programme, and so things like this, kind of networking and meeting each other, training and one-to-one -one support. So if you're a member of the network, you can access those things. And we also run a youth arts programme, which is specifically for people under the age of 25, um, 16 to 25, that's supported through the National Lottery. And um, through that, we run our participatory arts short course, which Hannah teaches on. Um, and we also have started the Youth Arts Sustainability Grant, which Ty was involved in as well. So there's a lot going on. We are a small part-time team of three, <laughs> so it's quite it's quite a lot. Um, but we have some exciting future plans to um, kind of expand the network. So do keep an eye out for that. At the moment, membership is free. So if you're interested, um, you can sign up on our website. So that's a little bit about us. And then if we move on to the next one. I just wanted to give a little bit of context and background about what participatory art actually is and what it means because I know that not everyone is kind of familiar with the term and actually the word participatory is quite a, a mouthful, it's quite a tongue twister um, and there's quite a lot of different terminology that you might have heard being used like socially engaged practice, community practice um, but our focus on participatory really just comes down to the root of people actively participating um, in an art form. So the ideology behind it is that it's shifting from a kind of individual, individuality, like individual studio practice to a collective one. And um, participatory arts emphasises moving away from the concept of, of the artist as an individual and to be more of a collaborator in the creation of situations or artworks with people. And it encourages people to be active participants rather than passive spectators. Um, and this kind of applies to all art forms. And it has the potential to break down partic participation barriers and um, societal kind of oppressions that are present in both people's everyday lives and in the, the kind of power structures that we see in the institutionalised art world as well um, and people not being able to kind of access that. So there's kind of different levels of participation and obviously I'm not going to go into this too much because we teach a whole course on it and we don't have very much time this morning <laughs> but if you are interested you can email and we can send you lots of information. But yeah, um, we recognise that not all participatory projects can achieve the same level of participation and that like each project is kind of assessed for what it can realistically achieve within a community um, and we know that kind of different commissioning bodies and funders might have different ideas about what they want to see achieved in that community compared with the artist or even the participants sometimes, so it's a constant dialogue um, a constant kind of evolution of what we can do and achieve within communities. Worth mentioning, and I'm sure we'll come on to this as well, is that as a participatory artist, you're often more than just an artist. You end up being a mentor, a partner, a collaborator, a facilitator, enabler. And I think really rooted in that is this idea of care. Um, and wanting to help people and look after the communities that you're working with. Um, also, we always, we drum into this um, idea of it's kind of focused on process rather than product. So the, the value that we see in participatory arts is people participating in the act of making rather than the final outcome. But that's not to say that it can't produce a really interesting and thought-provoking final outcome, it's just that we place a lot of value on what people get out of coming to um, participatory activity, whether that's help for their kind of well-being or confidence um, or various other things that we see. So um, to sum up my kind of very quick um, summary of participatory practice, um, to me anyway it is about acknowledging but not assuming the impressions that other people might be experiencing in their everyday life. 
Um, and recognising that oppression exists and actively trying to avoid practising oppressive kind of methods um, which reinforce the economic and social forces that keep people down effectively. So it kind of stems from this idea of self-liberation and um, understanding that people are, the people in the communities are the best people to liberate themselves from the oppressions that they face. Um, and as a participatory artist, you kind of go in and you analyse and recognise the, the forces that are contributing to people's oppressions and work collectively together um, towards transforming their realities through art. Um, so yeah, that's a kind of that's a kind of summary. Have I missed anything super important? Do you think? I think that's so, a great summary. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> as I said, we could go on for hours about this, so if you are interested in finding out more, please get in touch with us. Um, but yeah, I thought I would start off with the first question, which is around the theme of endurance. Um, so endurance is the creative morning theme for October. What comes to mind when you think about endurance and participatory practice? And I thought we would start with Hannah first, and then Ty, and then Phil. Thanks, Jade. Um, so, so my practice is completely, or strives to be, participant-led, and I'm always aware, you mentioned oppression, I'm always aware of the possible, again, not assuming, oppression and very challenging life circumstances that people in the room have faced and are facing, and absolutely take my hat off at every group that I work with of the strength that its participants are showing. Um, so endurance and that participatory arts and arts practice can help. I like to hope that it helps with the endurance of getting through. Um, obviously, you mentioned um, New Scots, refugee asylum um, community that pops into my head. I've worked a lot with women's groups, women who are in the social justice system and what they have endured in their lives and what they're continuing to endure is incredibly powerful. And when I'm in that space, I guess I'm enduring that too as a human and trying not to take too much of that on and I've got my own lived experiences. So the art form, whatever it is we're doing, is is helps us with that endurance and then the other thing I thought about because I do a lot of sourcing funding and making projects happen and producing is how challenging it is for the participatory art sector to endure through all of these cuts, the financial crisis, trends in funding um, and a lot of what the Glasgow Connected Arts Network is about is about supporting the people who feel either individual as artists or grassroots organisations but really struggling up against quite a lot of barriers um, to endure as an organisation or in their practice through these really challenging times. So yeah, that kind of level on an individual on the people that are in the room and then as a sector. But the incredible thing is if we want to make art and be creative, it does endure and it's about the people. So that was all the kind of stuff that popped into my head. Yeah, so I think very much building on what Jade and Hannah have already said, I think that while we have social issues in society um, and things in our social system that we don't um, kind of like, I suppose, like all these injustices and oppressions that you were mentioning, while we can recognise the social good of arts and particularly participatory arts, which I think is so refreshing in how consciously it seeks to kind of engage and be aware of these things so I think um, while we can recognize that power of kind of coming together and the resilience that it can build in us as individuals and in coming together with a group and also in our communities I think that's that's really powerful um, and I think that kind of goes into why it's so important for art to be accessible and that participatory art really kind of has this this consciousness to, to make it accessible um, I guess that's on the kind of broader level. I also wanted to mention, Hannah, you're kind of mentioning there the funding, and I think when you're 
quite established in this way, you're very much aware of all these issues. For me, I'm still very green and naive to this participatory <laughs> arts world, so yeah, I don't feel like endurance is such a thing so much yet that I've had to deal with because it still feels like a real privilege to be able to engage with people, but I think it really can build endurance in communities and in groups um, and coming together and creating that space to explore issues. Thanks. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, similar, I, I went for it, I jotted down instinctive thoughts um, I wrote down survival and resilience and I think that we will always come back to the arts, we will always come back to creativity as human beings, we need to do that, we need to tell stories, we need to paint pictures, we need to sing songs, it's what keeps us going um, fundamentally um, and finding ways to do that together is probably the most the actual root <laughs> of what of what participatory arts is and what making art is um, so in order to make that happen we need to be adaptable and we need to work out where we where we're going to gather and what we're going to do and um, and respond to the communities around us um, similarly thinking about the participants and the artists going through a process is so good for our mental well-being it's about coming together, it's about connectedness, these are all words I'm sure, <laughs> um, connectivity, there you go, I got there in the end. Um, it's from the individual sat there with a pencil doodling to a whole community coming together um, and experiencing something together and I think that's why it endures. Um, I wrote down the friendly songs. <laughs> I even spelt it right and everything. Uh, after COVID happened, at a government level, we were told as participatory artists that we could now solve everybody's problems. Um, we could be brought out as this damaged little army that we were, because um, we were told to go and get another job, if you recall. Um, <laughs> yeah, the arts is rubbish now, go and work in Tesco's. Um, but then once COVID had finished, we were brought out to save the day and we were going to be rebuilding communities and we were going to be bringing people together and do you know what oh, i nearly swore i'm really i'm cl this close <laughs> we we did it we actually did it we went out there fragile as we were and we brought community groups together in their fragile worlds that they were some people who had not left the house in an entire year and a half were sat telling stories, drinking tea, holding hands. The art was second, perhaps, mm -hmm. to it all, but it was there, it was why we met. Um, and before I get soapboxy and angry about where that's all happened <laughs> and where it's all gone now, um, I will skip that a little bit and go on to flexibility and responding to what's, what's available. And as you were saying, Ty, about funding and, um, and where it all is and, and who, who has the money, I think it's our job as a participatory artist to respond to where the money is. What is the latest thing that people are trying to support? Um, is it about food sustainability? Is it about mental well-being? Is it about the environment? And can we respond to that authentically as artists? And I think that that's really key, is sort of seeing where the latest fund is and going, I've got this, I've got this, because I make art, and I make art with communities, and I can make that happen, and it can be real and meaningful. So I think that, is a, that bolsters our endurance as participatory artists. Thank you. Yeah, that's really great. Um, yeah, if we move on to the next slide, please. I just realised that I forgot to talk about a project that I think is a really good example of endurance um, that we were involved in from COVID and it's still running today. Um, so this project was called Museum of Things and it was a partnership project between us and Mary Hill Integration Network. Um, basically it started during lockdown and it was to kind of create a community between new Scots living in Mary Hill um, primarily and the group started meeting online regularly in 2021 um, and it was run by an artist called Musa um, and an, another artist called Paria who both had lived experience of um, being through the kind of asylum process. They 
it was just amazing to see. Um, from the beginning, they were experimenting with lots of different techniques. Um, they tried out many different things, and then eventually, this all accumulated in an exhibition, um, which was what was the canal place um, along? It was like yeah. an old bike store that wasn't even a gallery. Like it was just like a random space that they found. Um, and repurposed it into a gallery and basically built a gallery for their exhibition, which was incredible. Um, and I think what was really powerful about this is when people started, they um, were maybe doing it for the social aspect or yeah, to reduce isolation. And then by the end, there was practicing artists in that group who defined themselves as an artist and who were having more exhibitions and even like selling their work. So it was a really incredible thing to see people's confidence grow throughout that process um, and I think what was really important in that was the artists themselves not being precious about what was being produced but letting go of their own kind of like authorship or their own artistic ego and letting people, letting the individuals in the group roll with their own ideas and what they wanted to do and try and that's what made it to me, a really, really successful kind of example of endurance. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in their work, I think they're still running. Yeah, they've got, we found a home at the CCA, so the CCA yeah. opened their doors, welcomed them, and that's their kind of regular space. So that's pretty amazing and wonderful um, as well. And yeah, the group, the group is very much still going. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll go into question number two now, which is what or who keeps you motivated and inspired? Do you have an example of a really good participatory project you've worked on or seen recently? So I've changed the order, so I'll start with you, Ty. <laughs> yeah, so I think this is something, like there are so many amazing examples in Glasgow, like we could probably go on about this for a while, so I'll try and keep it relatively brief. Um, the first one that I wanted to talk about was Rumpus Room, um, which is where I run my food focus craft group. I think they're amazing for lots of reasons. They're really kind of reflexive and try and kind of keep their practice moving forward. They really put their money where their mouth is in terms of always wanting everything that's run in their space to be free and accessible, but also they kind of pay that forward to the people using the space. So. Um, if you don't have funding, you can use the space for free and use their materials for free. Um, they're kind of an arts organisation in Govan Hill, um, working with young people, for anyone that doesn't know. And I just wanted to mention a few others, because there's lots. Um, the other one that I think is great is Jangling Space, which is stained glass co-op in Shorelands. Um, and they're great because they kind of bring people together, kind of with a social inclusion aspect, but you know, you're making stained glass, lots of people from all walks of life. I think that's great because it's a really like it's a really rewarding process um, and like a kind of inaccessible art form that you wouldn't really be able to do otherwise. Um, and then you get that reward of being able to sell your work, um, which is fab. Um, and then also just to be a bit of a suck up, I wanted to mention the participatory arts short course, which I am <laughs> which I am part of at the moment. Um, just because I think maybe for people in this room hearing this discussion, you're maybe thinking, okay, yeah, this is stuff that I've thought about before, but I think like an actual almost discipline and like a, something that there's a lot of dialogue and research around. So I think when you've kind of been trying to work this stuff out for yourself and think, okay, how do I want to bring this into my own practice? Like then suddenly being exposed to all, all the work around it that you and Colin have been facilitating um, and letting us know about um, is really useful. So I just wanted to mention that one as well. Thank you. Um... Uh, yeah, brilliant. Um, <laughs> um, I, um, <laughs> I thought, it's so cheesy. It's the participants that keep me going. Yeah. It's the, it's, that's the reason I do what I do, yeah. and that could be collaborating with other artists. Make you know, just just being two people in a room together making work, um, or it could be the real kind of grassroots stuff. Um, uh, I sound like I do, but I don't. There's no definition for me between being um, uh, what an artist is. Anyone who makes something creatively is an artist. Um, you can be a professional artist and get paid for it, and congratulations to you. Or you can just make make amazing art for your friends, for yourself. Um, and um, and I think that that's I think that's really important. 
Um, I think, um, uh, what did I write down? Why did I write down this? What was the question? I, w I, <laughs> I think that um, the process of it keeps me going and that kind of, there's always a similar thing that happens um, at your kind of grassroots participatory practice. And the first bit is the wobbly bit. There's a lot of bravery in a room. People have arrived in a space together and they don't really know why they're here, but it sounded interesting. <laughs> um, and you're all here and so you're all working each other out. Um, and then there might be, that might dip a bit, there might be a bit of distrust. When I start talking and I start going, right, we're going to try this together, and there's a bit of, oh no, <laughs> there's, there's reluctance there. We work through it, it's fine. Um, then, it, then we kind of find a rhythm and we're going along with it and we're kind of just getting used to each other and being in each other's space. And that's where, as an artist, a kind of facilitator, you start to push it a little bit, just gently. Just gently getting people to try new things. Um, then there's a kind of like, this is quite fun. I'm going to come back. I'm going to come and try this again. Um, and then the best bit, and it doesn't take long, is owning it. And suddenly you find that everybody's come through this process together, the artist included, where you are all in the same boat and you're all owning whatever this thing is. Um, and so when you talked about the letting go of ego and the space that was created uh, by the Museum of Things, I absolutely know what that feels like and that is a real kick. That is a real <laughs> hit and you're like, yes, we're in it. Um, there are amazing um, projects and amazing um, examples of work. Um, I'm going to name drop my own company um, called Mortar Projects, which is quite a unique um, space a unique model of working um, it's bringing um, predominantly visual artists but not exclusively um, together um, from the kind of street arts kind of side of things to work together and experiment and develop their art form um, and so there are there are people who are paid for mural work and there's people who literally just go back tagging glasgow and together we're all working in this space and making art together and it's fun and it's playful and it's it's just adults playing in one space it's brilliant um, and then lastly I just wanted to talk about a little tiny project and these are these are examples that pop up everywhere they're not exclusive they're not they're not big shouty things when an artist is brought in um, to support a little group through mental health challenges and this happens time and time again. This is the kind of bread and butter for the participatory artist. And you don't know who you're going to meet. And you'll start working together. Recently, I did one at, at an allotment. So, um, Red Fisher Council said, let's bring some adults together um, to make art in a, in a local allotment. And, um, and we did. And it was, it, was, it was small, and it was neat, and it wasn't shouted about, it wasn't public. We just drew together, we painted plant pots together, we wandered around the allotments, um, and it's magic, because everybody did feel better in that space, and everybody came back time and time again. Um, because I can't let go about this sort of thing, I will say that it was a magical 10 weeks that should have continued and wasn't because it was dropped by the council. And this is one of the things coming back to endurance that we need to fight as a sector. We need sustainability. We need to make it happen so that it's not just one-off projects here and there. It hurts us and it hurts the communities. Um, so we need, to, we need to shout about that kind of stuff. You're here. <laughs> yeah. um, Hannah, do you have anything to add? Uh, yeah, I mean, again, similar to Philippa in the sense that it is very much the participants um, that inspires my work and you don't know what's next, you don't know who's going to ask you to do what, and it's always a very privileged um, position to be in. But it was interesting you were saying, Phil, there about um, when everyone arrives and you kind of come along, you don't know what to expect, that nervousness. I and mean, then I suddenly thought about when I'm in the room and we do know why everyone's there, 
I'm, good, I'm trying to get them to do drama. <laughs> <laughs> so, for example, I'm just thinking about um, a lot of women in Scotland that you might know get kind of community, community orders rather than are in prison. We try very hard in Scotland um, not to prison women, especially women that have got children. So there are these little locked units all over the country that we don't know about, or some people do know about. So I've worked in some of these locked units. It's a very small, oppressive, they're essentially often like flats. Um, so I was thinking of a project I did recently. So it's, yeah, we think drama's a good idea. How much do you cost? I cost this. Uh, okay, that's fine, come along, as you say, for 10 weeks and do drama with these women who are enduring incredibly awful situations. And let's be honest, we're mostly in prison because they stole something and they have an addiction. Um, and so they are suffering, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and so we're all in this, <laughs> they're often trying to do drama in a space that's like got a big table in the middle. Uh, so I walk into the space and the first thing I do is I'm like unfolding tables. But again, all I'm thinking about at this point, yes, I have drama as a tool to work with these women, but all I'm thinking about is them. All I can think about in my body is what they're going to get out of this. And it can, it can actually be quite a lot of pressure on you as a human because I, I, I just always want to do my best and I want to get the best experience and I don't want them to hate drama because I know that they might have, if they've had much experience of drama at school, it might have been a really negative experience. It might have been in that experience where they were handed a script and um, they're dyslexic or they didn't even know they were dyslexic and they were to stand up in front of everyone so their preconceptions of what drama is is often a massive barrier for me to overcome no no i don't have scripts what do you mean you don't have scripts you'll find out we don't have scripts <laughs> um, i'm not saying that i never work with scripts because sometimes we do but my favorite practice is about telling stories so and again in a kind of prison situation or we wouldn't call it press, a locked unit situation, a women's unit situation, I'm not going to say, so why are you here? Because that's not appropriate. So again, it's this balance of telling other people's stories. Am I going to bring in a stimulus of a story or characters? I'm going off on a tangent here. But basically, it's never the same. You never have you can't have your own preconceptions of what it's going to be like, but it is, it is the groups that inspire me in every single project I do, I learn. I know um, I got quite into applied storytelling at the moment, so there's an amazing organisation, we're giving an example of an organisation called the Village Storytelling Centre, who are based in Pollock, and they're doing a project. You know when you hear a project and you wish that you were involved in it? <laughs> so this is one of these like, oh, that sounds good. So I was speaking to a colleague and it's called Voices of Peace. And it's a women's group who have got lived experience of um, the asylum seeker refugee uh, communities, um, kind of from the global majority. It's based in Pollock, it's free. It's for um, female identifying people, but you can, if you live anywhere in Glasgow, you can attend, you don't have to be in Pollock. And they have got a book, which I need to check out, um, which I haven't yet, called All the Stories We Can Tell. And in that space, it's, it's about if the women want to share their stories, but it's like imagined stories, um, perhaps interwoven with real stories. So it's using storytelling in an applied setting. Um, and that's right up my street. So I wanted to give a shout out to Village Storytelling Centre. Yeah, thanks so much. Yeah, I guess what everyone has kind of touched on is this idea that like no two days or like no two projects are the same and you're constantly learning and adapting and evolving. So that's really interesting, which brings me nicely to the next question, um, which I think we might have to we might have time for another one after that. Um, but as someone who's involved in participatory arts, because all of you are what does a typical day in the life look like? So I'm not going to pick an order, but if anyone has a like burning desire to say what they're Mine's doing. Mine's dead quick, if you want a quick one. <laughs> um, I don't have a typical day um, at all, um, which half suits me because I'm all over the place anyway, and half destroys me because I probably need protein. <laughs> um, but what I try and do is I, I the mornings are generally quiet, that's the admin side of things. 
Um, and then the afternoons and evenings tend to be the creative and, and that it just seems to be that pattern. Um, so that's, that's kind of it. There isn't a typical week, there isn't a typical day. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately it's not my day job, um, participatory arts. So mainly my day to day is filled with food, which does bring a lot of inspiration around different food work. Um, and I try and bring arts into that as well because I think it's a bit more interesting with kind of public facing events than just like talking about food policy. Um, but I will say that over the universal is just lugging like way too many arts materials around. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to get people to help me carry stuff, but yeah, my work is awesome. That's one of the great things about drama. You could show up in another way. Um, I'm finished. You sure? <laughs> I wrote down mum, food, emails. Mum, <laughs> day job, which is interesting. Mention the day job thing. I've managed a couple of arts organisations as well. You always like don't blow your own trumpet, but maybe this is the time to do that. I don't know. But I am constantly uh, with the thing about um, no two days are the same. That's totally true, and I've I've done participatory arts full time as a manager. I've done it full time as a freelancer. Um, and I'm always seem to be, um, it's the day job, it's not the day job. It, I'm always seem to try and find that balance. I've not found it. Um, although at the moment, maybe, because I've got like three days a week day job. So my stress, we were just talking about at the moment. Monday is kind of mum, emails, social media, I'm not very good at that. Um, food, sleep, um, laughter, friendship, try and weave that in as well. Um, but so Mondays I'm catching up and prepping my freelance stuff. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday I'm doing the day job in the library, um, and I've deliberately not put the emails for that on my phone. So to try and differentiate, I think the, the boundaries thing as well between that kind of more kind of formal day job if you like. So I go in and do that. And um, Fridays I try to keep as a me day. Um, I don't seem to be very good at that. <laughs> So I'm here doing this, <laughs> and, and I think I was speaking to someone at the beginning, oh, it was us, I was like, are you working this weekend? Times like, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, yeah. so again, there's no typical, the, and I think we were talking a bit about when we came in, um, about what's next as well, so I'm a bit of a what's next panicker, mm -hmm. so Mondays and Fridays, I'm quite often looking around, sending emails, do I need more work, do I not need more work, is this lead going to lead anywhere, is it not, um, oh no I haven't put anything on Instagram, um, that's, 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 yeah, that's <laughs> do I want to go back to university, I'll come back for the third time, that's a good idea, I'm going to do a PhD, no I'm not, oh that's, that's my life, <laughs> yeah, it's like three jobs plus a course, but anyway, um, it's great. I was putting a giant iceberg in my car on last Friday, so yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so very, very, very quickly, um, I was just going to ask what helps you endure as a practitioner? And we've kind of written a little bit on our, um, like after a difficult or challenging day, like what we might do. So yeah, just very, very quick. <laughs> I'm, I'll come back to collaboration again. I think that helps me to it helps me endure. Somebody else has got a really good idea, and they go, "Do you want to do this, Phil?" I'm like, "Yeah, I'll pretty much say yes." Um, it gives me energy. It inspires me. Learning, as you said, like maybe not uni for me, but learning from other people and um, is something that keeps me going, keeps me enduring. Sometimes, sometimes I'll admit, I I've started to feel I'm a little bit old for participatory arts um, and uh, but I can't give it up, can't quit it, it's just I've got to keep on going, um, it's what makes me tick. So, yeah. Thank you. I think having the space to get inspired and celebrate the different art that you've created in a group is really really good and kind of keeping going and making sure you have space for that and I also think in particular with kind of talking about food issues I think it's really kind of inspiring to be able to take that from an arts perspective because you're kind of leaving people the space to engage or not to engage and for me like it keeps my work around food really interesting and kind of I guess helps me endure and stay engaged um, myself so yeah just to share. 
I think out of everything, it's young people. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, I've worked with all different groups, but I'm just so aware about this is their future. And I was so lucky that I found, I mean, I didn't know it was called Participating to the Arts when I was like 16, 17. I was in youth theatre, and that was my voice being heard, and <coughs> me and my pal's voice being heard. And that was how it started for me. And so the art never came first. The being in the room came first, and I discovered what I was doing was art. And that feeling, a bit of what you were saying about the participating to the arts course, there wasn't how to do it, we kind of worked it out, and then I went and studied. But I guess what I'm saying is that what motivates me is the idea of one of young people finding this as um, a career option. Mm -hmm. That you don't have to, yes, there's no right or wrong, like the day job, and that you can actually get paid to do this. That it is a career, it's a viable career, yes, you have to have a lot of endurance, but it's wonderful and amazing, and there's a support network out there. So yeah, I think the number one thing is probably is, is, young, is young people. Yeah, and for me, I would say it's collective and having um, support. I think that's the most important thing. But yeah, I think that's us. So if we've got time for questions, uh, I think we probably have time for one question. <laughs> we also like to talk a lot. <laughs> um, I, I don't know about y'all, but I mean, a lot of that really resonated for me, you know, in, in terms of um, being inspired by other people and, and, and also like the fact that everyone is creative and we need to be around other people, uh, not maybe for every bit of our work, uh, but for at least for part of it. Um, so thank you very much to the panel. Uh, we'll just do a quick uh, um, thank, you, thank you so much for sharing your, your stories. And yeah, it's very, very inspiring to hear, you know, from different stages, different experiences. I, I think it's, it's fantastic. Um, do we have any, any questions? I've got one small one, but uh, does anybody have any questions? About like how we show up in this space, like when we're starting with folks for the very first time. Hi, uh, I'm Jess, by the way. <laughs> uh, I think that often, like depending on how the group is formed, if it's like or already a group, or if it's people who responded to a call out or whatever, like they kind of have a preconceived notion of who is this person coming in? Is this person funded by an organization, or is this just like a random person we found on the internet? I, I guess I'm just like, what's your go-to spiel when you introduce yourself or say what you are, or like, I'm a Portuguese recorder, or like, yeah, <laughs> what do you? Or like, if you're funded by academia or a researcher or like whatever, like, yeah, sorry, loaded question. <laughs> no, but it's a really good one. It's really um, good one. I guess I'll start off by talking a little bit about the kind of context of what makes good practice, which is not parachuting into a community. Mm -hmm. So like, I, in the, I, and I know that this isn't always realistic, but the ideal scenario would be that you work long term with that community, you really get to know them, you aren't even making art for the first bit, you're actually just hanging out and building trust before you even get to that stage. Mm -hmm. um, because I think, yeah, if you do go in as a kind of alien, <laughs> almost, it's like, yeah, who is this person and why should we trust them? Right. Part of part of the yeah, um, so I think, yeah, it's also good to be mindful of, like, who is commissioning this project and to what outcome they are looking for. Because, yeah, as Phil was saying earlier, like, going in to govern to solve poverty like that's not a realistic outcome but that is one that has like my teacher <laughs> said that he like got this funding he was like i can't do that yeah. so i think it's being realistic about what can be achieved within the time frame that you've got as well um, and really getting to know the group and what they want rather than bringing in your own ideals um, or yeah trying to maybe like if the, if the funder has really strict ideas what they want like having a dialogue so that you can adapt and evolve what you're doing to really meet the needs of the participants. Yeah. Can, can I add, there's a, there's a balance, I think, to be met, <laughs> that is about being the authority 
in your subject mm -hmm. and in, the, in the holding the space, mm -hmm. you need to be trusted that you can do that and being and having humility mm -hmm. in the space that you don't know everyone yet and you don't know what everyone's been through and it's almost it's, I don't, this makes light of it but it's almost a game finding the balance between those two things and making sure that people know who you are and that you can hold this space and yet you you will give them time um to uh, to be, to let you know how they're going to function in the space. I do quite a lot of cracking jokes, <laughs> so I think that even if I'm brought in for sort of a really serious topic, just about most of the time, I want to bring laughter, and if I think like energy, laughter, motivation. But I just say, yes, I come from the theatre drama background, but this is about you, this is about what you want to make. I'm here to help, I'm here to bring in some random ideas. If you want them, take them, if you want them, do something else, I'm here to support you. So I think it's just having that very open, honest, really, sometimes I call it, sometimes I go, oh, the council funded me to do this, but we'll just do that. You know, <laughs> I, I just, I tend to just put it all out there, right? So there's no us and them, because that's just not, that's not going to work, because that's not how I work, and it's going like, we're doing this, let's go for it. Just really open. Yeah, I do find that humour and that honesty really useful, and also if I'm coming at something for maybe it's, I'm doing it for a food organisation with a particular message, it's almost that flexibility and allowing whoever's participating to take what they want from it and engage with it how they want, that almost makes me feel a bit more comfortable about like I'm bringing you something that I want you to engage with or feedback to me somehow but you're getting to shape it how you wish and do something artistic with it so that almost makes me feel a little bit better sometimes than like I'm not just like pestering you about the food system or whatever yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. That's, a, that's a great question um, thank you very much excellent well thank you very much to the panel um, I believe that